All right, guys, we are live. Episode 86 of the Shooter's Mindset. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got some star-studded guests here with us. Here we got a co-host, Jennifer Seymour's in the house. What's going on, Jennifer? Hey, guys, doing doing well. Excited about this show. Yeah, excited to have you on again, Jen. And Steve, the Tank Durant is in the house. What's going on, Steve? What's going on, guys? It's going to be a good one. Have a good time. Learn some stuff about the big boys. Yeah, for sure. And the man of the hour is the CEO of JP Enterprises, and that's John Paul himself. What's going on, John? Hey, it's great to be here. I'm, uh, I've been looking forward to it. But to correct that, actually, my wife is the CEO, because we need adult supervision here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's usually the case. You're just the first one to admit it live. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the guy with, with some ideas, and uh, she runs the place, because uh, that's beyond my ken. Yeah, I agreed. I usually always say that. I'm like, yeah, the wife's involved in the company, so she's the one who tells you what to do and how to do it. You're just yeah. the guy that has the label. Seriously, yeah, yeah. She's the administrative genius here, and if it wasn't for her, uh, nobody out there would be getting their orders. <laughs> agreed. Very nice. So we got uh, we remind you guys of the Q and A section in the bottom left hand corner of the show. You're going to see a Q and A app. If you click on that, it'll open up a separate window, and you can ask live questions to any of us here on the panel. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, probably 100% of those are going to be for John Paul himself over at JP Rifles. He has a lot of experience playing the game of competitive shooting and building rifles and accessories and engineering stuff. So this is a really good time if you guys have any live questions that you want to hit on anything of their products. This is a, I mean, you can't get any better than hearing it from directly from the CEO's mouth himself, so there you go. Um, also, if you guys head over to uh, uh, the Shooter's Mindset on Facebook, if you guys prefer to use Facebook to put your questions in, there'll be a post going up probably right in a couple minutes where you can post your questions below, and we'll monitor those throughout throughout the show time, and we'll get them out as, as soon as we can. Got a great giveaway here in the show. We want to talk about some show sponsors. Fort Mill Munitions, as always. Fort Mill Munitions, if you guys have some ammo that you need, custom loaded for your pistol stuff, go check out Fort Mill Munitions. That's teamfmm.com, um, and they got it all there over there as far as pistol stuff. Um, Blade Tech Industries is a big supporter of the show. Um, go check out, they, I mean, they have everything over there at Blade Tech. So holster, gear, competition needs, accessories, it's all there. Go check out Blade Tech. And our, and our, and our friend uh, Brett Russo is always a big supporter of the show, so go check the, all these guys out, fine companies, fine folks. Um, and that'll do it. Let's jump right into into it here. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with JP Enterprises, tell us a little bit more about the company, how it got started, and where it's at today. Well, my father got me into competitive shooting as a young kid. Uh, he wasn't a competitive shooter himself, but he was into hunting. And, and of course, when I was uh, very young, he bought me the typical uh, Daisy Red Rider. But he set it up with, uh, he took one of my mother's belts and set it up as a sling. And, and he had done some uh, competitive shooting in the, in the, when he was in the service. So he taught me how to shoot uh, with, the, with a sling set up. And uh, later on, he got me involved in, with a junior rifle club in uh, St. Paul. And uh, when I got out of school, when I got out of college, I realized I was unemployable in any conventional sense of the word. So I had to do something that I felt I knew something about. And uh, guns was one of those things. So uh, I ended up uh, selling my house and buying a retail gun shop. <laughs> and I think I was, I worked for the previous owner for about six months to learn the gunsmithing trade. And when I finally, when he finally left and I uh, was in there by myself, it took me about two weeks to realize I really didn't know anything about it. Now, luckily I had one of their former employees that stayed on with me. And between the two of us, we kind of muddled our way through it. And I figured it took me about two years before I really had a handle on it. Uh, we, we specialized really in, in uh, guns and uh, uh, for other for people in various uh, competitive shooting uh, you know endeavors, uh, not to mention you know certainly the hunting crowd too, but uh, in particular we were really heavy into uh, loading equipment and components, so that was something I had to get my head around there, and and of course eventually we were, became known as the place in town to go for that. I, I ran that place for about 13 years, and it was in uh, actually North Minneapolis, which is kind of a, a tough area in uh, North Minneapolis. And towards the end of that 13 years, I ended up getting. Uh, 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 burglarized about once a year, and uh, at some point my insurance canceled. And I realized it was 
And no matter what I did to the security in the place, it, it just seems like they were always trying to figure out one more way to get into this place. And uh, I remember, I'll never forget one morning, it was a Saturday morning, it was about 6 o'clock, and the phone rang. And I, before I even picked it up, I knew that it was the police calling me that the place had been broken into again. And sure enough, that was the call. And I just made the snap decision right then and there that I was going to go in there, clean that place up, liquidate it, and just move on to the next thing. <laughs> so that's what we did. We cleaned her up, and in 30 days, I sold the place to the wall. And uh, I decided, because I had been involved in competitive shooting you know, for quite a few years at that time, I was, it was uh, rolling pins, IPSC, that sort of thing. And uh, I was particularly fascinated with the practical shooting, even though I had come from the precision shooting world, you know, uh, primarily small bore indoor competition. But I decided I really needed to get, in, to get into making accessories for other people shooting competitively because I felt I, understand, I understood it from, from the customer's eyes and I knew that uh, what, uh, what people would be interested in to improve their, their ability. So that's when I started this. And I didn't really know where I was going with it at first. So uh, when I got out of that, when I got out of the retail setting there, I went on a pilgrimage. And this was in uh, 1990. And I, I, I signed up and took all three of the, of the shooting schools that were available at that time, which was uh, Gunsight, uh, Masada Yu's uh, Traveling uh, School, and, uh, and also, uh, 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 what was the one down in Missouri there? <clears throat> Slips in my mind here. Uh, I can't remember. Gun just, site, just, you said, said Gunsight? Yeah, what's, the, what's the school that was in, in Missouri for many, many years, still there now? Missouri, man. Yeah. yeah, I can't think of it now. But uh, Dustin's from it, Missouri, and he's not here with us. He probably would have knew. Because that was before, and I mean now there's just been a proliferation of these uh, shooting schools. But that back then, that was about it. It was really three main schools. So I went on a road for a month and uh, took all these courses, just trying to decide where I was going to fit in the industry. And uh, uh, one of my good friends was Dan Coonan. If you've heard of Coonan Arms, he was the guy that designed the first Magnum class in 1911 semi-auto pistol. And we kind of grew up in the industry together. In fact, he was one of my customers at the retail store, and, and we kind of hit it off together. And, and he had some connections with vendors, and uh, he set me up with uh, Stormlight Machine. And so I got when I started out, I was selling uh, 1911 and, uh, and P9 comp kits into the you know, IPSC community. And that's before internet sales. There was nothing like that then, so I was just running ads and Frontside magazine. And uh, the, the ironic thing is that when I had this retail store, I absolutely hated AR-15s. I literally wouldn't have one on the rack. I mean, I lest it pollute my nice bolt guns up there. Yeah. <laughs> so one, one day, a, a guy came in with an old A1 Sporter Colt, and he wanted to trade it in on something, and I thought, well, you know, I had to do this, so I took this rifle in on trade, and it kind of piqued my curiosity. So I, I took it out and shot it just as it was. I was just curious what this thing could really do because it just looked like such a plastic piece of crap. And uh, much to my surprise, the thing shot about a minute and a half, just the way it was. And so I thought, well, you know, there might be some potential here. So I, at that time, I think it was Olympic Arms came out with these steel free float tubes. And these things weighed like five pounds. You could kill somebody with one. So I ordered up this free floating hangar. I put it on there with this stock barrel, which was... Uh, you know, about a half inch contour. It was like a, like a pencil thin barrel. And uh, lo and behold, that rifle shot under, under a minute <laughs> with that free flood tube on. And that's what really made me realize that, you know, that the rifle did have some potential despite all the other issues that it had. So when I finally got into uh, three gun competition, and it was really apparent that that was the rifle that really would dominate that sport, we started to set about one by one solving what I felt was the was the most glaring problems of it, as far as the sight recovery and of course the trigger. Like I said, one by one we sort of set about solving solving these issues as we saw it until finally we had a rifle that was pretty much completely of our own design. And that was the CTRO2 in two thousand two that was the first you know build of competition rifle. And then we went on to the side chargers and you know and the business kind of evolved from there. You know, some people think that we're a rifle company but we're actually not. We're a, we're a parts company. About seventy-five percent of our business actually is the, the component parts to the gunsmith and the home builder. In fact, I think Brownells uh, told me a couple of years back that we were their fourth largest vendor, which 
really surprised me. So uh, we, uh, you know, we started building our rifles really as more of a matter of personal pride. You know, we, no one was out there building anything other than a utilitarian grade AR-15. And so at one point, uh, back about uh, in the, um, it was about the mid '90s after I had this thing going up, up and running with the parts. I decided we had to build rifles using our components to just see how good we could make them. And so that that really is where the where the whole thing came from. Now, interesting story. So you didn't even you were one of those guys, like one of those guys that that was a diehard 1911 fan and didn't want to see a Glock anywhere near his store. You were a bolt action <laughs> gun gun type rifle guy and didn't care. It didn't give a darn about an AR-15. Now look where, look where it has it evolved yeah. today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's so funny you say that because when the when the Glock first came out, I thought it was the most ugly piece of crap I'd ever seen. You know, because again, strictly a 1911 guy, I looked at the 1911 really as being the samurai sword of pistols, and it's a, it's aesthetic beauty and everything that could be done with it. And it wasn't until I shot my first uh, local uh, uh, GSSF match, a Glock, you know, competition match. And uh, I finished sec second place with a with a gun that I borrowed, and so then I went up and actually bought one, and I said, "Well, let's see what we can do with this." And so then we started offering uh, trigger jobs, accessories on the Glock, and that's when I realized that uh, you know the the utilitarian beauty of the thing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, they're definitely not the prettiest gun uh, in the in the gun store counter, that's for sure. But they sure know they they function great for yeah. what it is. So that's that's awesome stuff here. Let's tr let's get the Q and A rolling, guys. There's one that just came in as soon as I said it. You must have heard. We must have read my mind. Q and A stuff over on the Facebook page, like always. If you guys are new to it, uh, Q and A section in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, but let's let's move forward with this one here. It's fair to say you you have been playing the game for a long time after the after you did what you just told us there. What are your thoughts on the future of three gun and rifle innovation? Obviously, there's a lot of Rifle companies everywhere you look, there you know, there's someone coming up with something new or a new part. Where do you think all this is going? Three gun and rifle innovation. Well, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, I uh, I consider myself one of the original uh, SOF crowd, you know, Soldier of Fortune uh, World Championship match. I was in Vegas every year, and uh, ironically, that was not the first three gun match I'd shot. I I, I shot really what was. Uh, USPSA would, you know, would not acknowledge three gun as, as an activity, but because there was so much uh, interest in shooting SOF and there was only limited slots, about 225 entries per year, they always had a long waiting list. People couldn't get into that, so uh, a couple other venues started up. And one, one was the Superstition Mountain three gun match, and the other was uh, Troy McManus running what he called a, a USPSA three gun nationals, even though they disavowed any any uh, connection to it at the time. So <clears throat> that was the first one I'd ever shot. It was out, and it was actually held up in Long Island, New York, of all places. <laughs> so that was my first exposure to it. And I always think back that when I showed up there, it was the same people then <laughs> as now. It was Jerry Michelik, uh, uh, Mike Voigt, and a bunch of other, a bunch of these other people who have just been involved in this sport for all these years. Uh, so finally, a couple of my buddies, uh, from Louisiana, I had been shooting SOF for a number of years before I did, and they, and they convinced me to uh, come down there and shoot it. And when I shot the SOF match for the first time, I realized that that was real three gun, and it really framed the use of three guns in a in a practical environment, and without uh, the cumbersome rule uh, structure that say that USPSA had, which I don't have any problem with in the pistol competition, but. I, uh, I guess uh, you, if, you, if you ask me what I think about you know three, where three guns should be, it should be the you know there's really a two two criteria. It's got to be safe and just got to be the same for everybody. And beyond that, it should be whatever we think it should be. Now, the, the thing that fascinated me about about the uh, SOF match, uh, probably more than anything, is that all the stages were either semi surprise or full surprise. In other words, you were not free to go walk through a stage and choreograph your last footprint in that stage. <clears throat> uh, and, and, the, and that really added a lot to the excitement of it, the adrenaline. And it really, and it really uh, in my opinion, framed it in a sense that in a real world, you're, you have to stay fluid. You have to be able to make decisions on the spot. And you don't want to be locking in this, this program solution to a course of fire and you're gonna like I said you've got it locked in so tight you know where every foot 
every foot that's going to be, every footprint, every shot is going to be taken. And even though you could watch a semi-surprise course, until you got into it three-dimensionally, you really didn't know what it was about. So it still had the, the adrenaline rush of something new that you were into it. You had to figure it out on the fly. And quite honestly, that, that uh, really uh, catered to a different mentality. And so if, if you look back in, that, in those days when guys were shooting that, that particular venue, uh, it was the, the guys who were winning it were not, were not young kids. They were in their 40s, even 50s. And uh, that was because it was really much more about experience and discipline and the ability to make decisions and get first shot hits than it was about being able to move quickly or having absolute athleticism. So you ask me where it's going. Well, obviously, uh, when, the, when the crew from the SOF retired, and I'm going to give them a lot of credit because that, ran, that match ran 29 consecutive years in the last 19 of those years by the same crew. And in 2003, uh, they had to move it to, uh, uh, they had had it up in Las Vegas for all those years. And finally, the Desert Sportsman Club got sick of uh, these big major matches because a few of the members were complaining about, uh, about uh, not being able to use the range, which was crazy because it was a big place and plenty of bays that we weren't even using. But be that as it may, they decided to have no further national matches. And, that's when uh, the SOF made a deal with the police department down in Bullhead, Arizona, across the river from, from Laughlin. So the final match was in 2003 at Bullhead. And uh, the Bullhead Police Department was supposed to have paved the parking lot and put paved trails in because uh, the match was going to be like a natural terrain match. And they didn't do that. And, of course, if you're familiar with uh, that area down there, the average daily temperature about that time of year is about 113 to 115. And the... the we ended up having to traipse back, uh, you know, a quarter to a half a mile of soft sand up to your ankles to get to where the stages were. And uh, everybody at the match was complaining about this, and I think that was the thing that pushed the crew over the edge and they finally decided to retire that year. So we, we took it and kind of picked up the gauntlet and moved on to the, to the Whittington Center, and we, you know, the J.P. Rocky Mountain 3 game. So that, that was kind of what, what I looked at as the evolution of the SOF going to the uh, – Whittington Center is a Rocky Mountain 3 game. But instead of SOF rules, it went on with the, the rules that were devised at the Superstition Mountain Match. And those rules were more about being able to get more people through a stage quickly. So you weren't scoring targets, which is two hits anywhere. They got rid of a, a SOF used kind of an IDPA type <clears throat> scoring system on the paper target. So it was accuracy stress. And uh, when it evolved, it evolved into more of a, a game that was all about speed. And the other major change was in the, in the SOF venue, you know, each, each, squad, each, uh, each RO crew was, was free to design their stage and however they saw fit. And it didn't have to correspond to any, any typical scoring situation. So even though they had some stages that were scored in this uh, Paladin or you know, a second base scoring system, there was a lot of other stages that they had that were were part-time stages that asked other questions, real-world questions, in my opinion, about can you hold your concentration for 45 minutes on the gun looking at an array of targets without knowing what you're going to engage? And they did that by having only five-man squads. So they actually they could have all five people on the line doing something in some, uh, in some fashion. And that was the, kind of the fascinating thing about that. Now, like I said, in the evolution of it, we went on to this uh, multi-gun scoring system that uh, you've heard about. And then eventually, when uh, the Three Gun Nation came into play, uh, they took it even a, a step further and brought and really, you know, Three Gun for tel television. So now the, the, the rifle problem got in, inside 100 yards, inside 80 yards typically. So then it became completely about speed and much more compressed courses that can be put on TV. And I, I'm, personally, I'm not too fond of that. But, hey, that, the sport is evolving, and it's actually evolving in several directions. And, the main thing is we got more and more people shooting competitively, and that's what's important to me. Definitely. Yeah, the three gun nation stages—they call them ho you know a lot of people call call them hoser stages. You know, not very deep shots involved, more of a speed game. Whoever can hit the most steel targets, you know, the fastest, boom, that's the way it's kind of become now. There's some nice, uh, there's some nice regional matches and stuff like that. You're reaching out really deep, you know, 500, 400 yards, throwing in 48 rounds. You know, with slugs and shot and bird shot. You know, you see people wearing like two vests. You know, like <laughs> right. you know, so it has gotten very nice. I know Kurt, uh, Kurt Gruber, 
put on a great match over in Texas uh, this past weekend with Three Gun. So a lot of history, a lot of uh, how it came up and where it's at now that John just talked about, which is awesome. And then we got some uh, live questions that came in on Gen Zen. You want to hit? You want to hit a couple? Yep, I have one that actually was asked when we were going to do the show before and had some issues, so I saved it because it was a really good question. Mike Bell said, can you ask this question for me? Recently, I built a new three-gun upper with a JP Cirac adjustable gas block on an 18-inch barrel with a rifle port position. I'd like to hear the best way to tune the gas block with a lightweight bolt carrier group to minimize recoil and muzzle rise. From what I heard, I need to shoot one shot at a time with an empty magazine and stop when I get bolt lock open. Is this the easy and most reliable way? Yeah, that's what I do. If you really want to tune it, you put one round in the magazine, and uh, if you close it off, and so it wouldn't lock back, keep opening up until you achieve reliable lock back. Now, you need to go past that, especially if you're going to write, use a rifle for a practical competition where you cannot have a malfunction. It's one thing if a guy's setting up a rifle for a, a varmint, for varmint use, and you can tune it right to the gnat's ass, and you don't care if, it, if the thing uh, pukes on you now and then. But if it's, it has a, a real-world application or for practical shooting, where the gun absolutely has to work, then you need to go, say, another uh, third to a half a turn past your lock pack back position so that you know the gun is just slightly overgassed, and when it gets fouled up, it's going to continue to run. There you go. Good tip there. I have one here from Sterling White, uh, Sterling W. Hello, all. Can you ask John about the history of the Lighten Bolt Carrier Group, trials and tribulations, and its evolution? <laughs> I know Sterling. <laughs> so, you know, as we uh, as we started working on these rifles, like I said, one by one, addressing the issues as as I saw it. And, and let me say that my idea of where the rifle had to go is is more related to my experience shooting soldier portion over those years, and because I really understood the the need for precision, the need for uh, reliability, and uh, for the fastest possible sight recovery on the rifle. So. A lot of, I mean, you, you can actually buy a lot of rifles now that are sub in because barrel manufacturing has gotten, gotten so much better. Uh, one of the things I felt that we brought to the table, you know, that no one else did was this really phenomenal sight recovery capability. So first thing, of course, we designed really efficient compensators. And uh, once, you, once we put the compensators on the rifle, uh, now it uncovered all the mechanical goings on that were masked before just by the impulse of the bullet leaving the barrel, you know, physics, reaction, action, reaction. So you put a, an efficient brake on a rifle and all of a sudden you could feel the, the, the reciprocating mass function of the rifle that's also part of the impulse. And so I decided that uh, both velocities in these rifle, rifles was unnecessarily high. So the second thing we did is we came up with the, with the adjustable gas system. We originated that, much copied now. But uh, in fact, it was kind of funny because for years, people thought we were nuts. You know, like, what do you need an adjustable gas system on these rifles for? Well, uh, first off, it, by getting rid of all that excess bolt velocity, which is expended when the buffer and the bolt and all that mass comes to a slamming stop against the back of the buffer tube, the rifle just becomes so much smoother to shoot. In fact, like that was, to me was the second biggest improvement after a real efficient muzzle brake. Being able to tune the bolt velocity and eliminating the bolt slamming effect was another night and day difference in the, in the feel of the rifle. And after we did that, it, it, just, it just thought to myself, well, now uh, why should we start playing games with the mass of the operating system? And uh, uh, ironically, uh, the, the the guy, one of the guys who worked for me, was actually my oldest employee, has been with me since the very beginning. Another really, a, Dave Kamek, a real firearms genius, and we really hit off each other on a lot of these different parts of the development. Well, he happened to have a, a prototyped aluminum carrier, and I don't even know where it came from. And it wasn't, it was in a raw, it was completely unfinished. And I thought, well, how could this even work? So we, we tried this thing, and lo and behold, it did work. And so, uh, uh, rather to do an aluminum carrier first off, we we wanted to do uh, uh, you know a low mass type of carrier. And actually, we weren't we weren't sad. It was another thing that kind of entered into that picture. We, we we were buying other people's components that we didn't make. For example, bolts and bolt carriers. And I wasn't satisfied with those components. They just didn't have the quality that I was looking for. So we. Uh, 
we designed our own bolt carriers and really addressed some of the issues that I, I felt that needed to be taken a look at. And then we started playing with the mass of those carriers, going to a low mass steel carrier, and of course ultimately a low mass aluminum, or, you know, aluminum carrier. And we ran that aluminum carrier. This was actually way back when we had this, what I would call ultra low mass carrier. And uh, it had a kind of an idiosyncrasy that uh, after, depending on the ammunition you're using, after maybe uh, two to 300 rounds, the bore of the carrier would fall up with carbon and it would kind of seize up. And uh, as long as you kept it real wet and you put some oil in the exhaust ports of the carrier, worked the bolt back and forth, it would slough that carbon off and then it would run another two, 300 rounds. But some people wouldn't listen to, uh, listen to us on that and they ran these things dry and they malfunctioned. And so uh, I decided to drop that way back then. And we just went on with the with the uh, our stainless low mass carrier, which didn't have any of those maintenance issues, and it was seemed to be just as reliable as the, as the full mass carrier. But we uh, found out, uh, you know, a couple of years ago that people had hoarded these carriers, and there was like a cult following them. And then people started to do some other low mass carriers made out of titanium, some other materials. But so we just reintroduced that carrier again, and uh, we were able to solve all these idiosyncrasies that it had originally. So. Uh, and I, I would use one as a duty weapon, but as an ultimate game gun part in combination with that silent captured spring system, it's uh, it's really an awesome setup. So you had this initial introduction. When when was the when was when was the year you guys came out with your initial low mass bow carry group? It was uh, I'd say late nineties, if I remember right. Wow, so I mean, I didn't even know what to yeah. connect that for. So then you guys, so then you guys, so then you guys scrapped it. And people started playing with it, and then you guys reintroduced something that was of of better, yeah. that that worked a little bit more reliable. So now you you look at where the it's like the low mass nowadays has been catching all these high, titanium. This right. there's this kind of metal. There's that type of metal. And now the who's who is like if you're going to run a three gun, and you're gonna you know you got to have a low mass. Now it seems like that's where has it has gone. But it's been available for a lot longer than my knowledge. I, I had no idea that it was available that that long ago. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's some of the stuff that uh, you know, we came up way back then. Uh, in, in a way, you know, it was really before before the the general market was really ready for it. And then, of course, we supplemented that by taking the, taking all the weights out of a standard buffer and putting in aluminum weights instead of the tungsten weights in the buffer. In fact, you know, at one point we played with empty buffers. Of course, the gun won't run with an empty buffer. But the aluminum weights reciprocate like for the, the dead blow effect. Just even with aluminum weights, weights in combination with a low mass ham, low mass carrier was enough to make a very reliable rifle actually. And by getting rid of all this mass in combination with tuning the bolt velocity, uh, the rifles uh, were almost recoilless. And so your sight recovery was uh, just phenomenal. You could, I, mean, I was able to shoot. A minute of angle groups at 100 yards, uh, you know, five shots in about five seconds, you know, because my scope was wandering so so little off target. Very nice. Right. So we got a question come from Daniel. I think Steve's got it. Yeah, I got one from Daniel here, hmm. and it's ironic that you just mentioned that about the, the low mass carriers. He was curious to know if the aluminum could be expected to be as durable as the stainless, and also what would the life expectancies on each of those be with general normal conditions? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, the our stainless carriers, <clears throat> which you can get either with a QPQ coating or in the white, and polished if you want the, the bling on them. Uh, I kind of look at those as uh, lifetime parts, uh, assuming you don't blow your gun up, you know. <laughs> but yeah, those, uh, those things, uh, they're, uh, Really, they've got their life expectancy is longer than the barrel or the upper receiver, you know, if you look at it that way. The aluminum carrier is certainly not a lifetime part. I look at it as a consumable. But when we first came out with it, I actually thought that, you know, that life expectancy was probably going to be somewhere in the 3,000 round range. And I expected that either the cam pin slot or the bore of the carrier was going to wear out. And that wasn't the case at all. Uh, even the original ones, we had guys that had uh, upwards of 9,000, 10,000 rounds to them. And... Uh, uh, it seemed that where they would finally uh, wear out was at the where the tailstock goes through the back of the carrier. Uh, the uh, high pressure gas would eventually erode that through. They'd start leaking a bit. But these new ones, uh, uh, we've already got people that have over 10,000 rounds through them, and they're working flawlessly. So, like I said, with the different with the different metal finishing we're using on them and some other uh, 
uh, some other features we put on them, I think we've extended the life expectancy. But there again, I, I wouldn't consider it a, uh, a part that you're going to pass down to your grandchildren. But, you know, you've got to pay for a, for a performance advantage, and that, that's the way you look at it. You, you use it until, until, for example, for some reason you see uh, short stroke malfunctions that uh, for, for no reason at all, that probably be indication that the carrier is warning. Awesome. Great, great question from Daniel. Let's do the giveaway here. We're almost we're at the 30 minutes into the show here. I didn't talk about the giveaway. We've got an awesome giveaway here, courtesy from the folks of JP, TacticalLife.net, and Blade Tech. Uh, giveaway here today is you're going to get two of the JP Enterprise silent captured re, uh, buffer springs. Those are awesome. You know, Jen Jennifer has a story that she'll probably share with the folks that built her rifle regarding that very product. So we have two of them. We're going to have two winners uh, for this giveaway. We also have one AR-15 JP handguard, and that's going to be that 12.5-inch uh, handguard model. You get to choose. I believe they have a couple models available on their website. We also have a JP full mass carrier, and we have a uh, Blade Tech Industries Revolution holster <coughs> kit. comes with the double mag pouch, the holster, and a training barrel. And we have TacticalLife.net has thrown throw in some of their sure grips for this giveaway. So we'll have two winners. We'll have a link going in the comment section below this video. Mm -hmm. We also already have a link on the Shooter's Mindset Facebook page, so go check that out. And this is going to last a week from now, so next Wednesday for episode 87, we're going to select the winners live during the show. We're going to have two of those, all right? So great stuff. If you uh, uh, bonus entries, obviously using the website that we that that it sends you to is uh, if you like JP Enterprise on Facebook and you like their social media, you get bonus entries. If you like Jennifer's page, there's, there's like ten or twelve ways you can get bonus entries into this giveaway. So take advantage of those. Uh, episode eighty-five giveaway winner, which was for um, I think it was five hundred rounds of extreme bullets, nine millimeter. We had a $200, $250 gift card to uh, Dissident Arms, so if you need any AK, Sega, shotgun work, they do a lot of gunsmithing services over there. That's $250 towards that. We had uh, Italian gun grease, like $70 worth of grease, lube, carbon cutter. had the whole deal in there. Um, and I believe there was also some Tactical Life Sure Grips in there. So Mike Bell... You are the winner of episode 85. So Mike Bell's watching. I think Mike Bell actually submitted the question to Jennifer that she asked first earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, unless that's a different Mike Bell. But Mike Bell, you're the winner. If you don't contact me, I will put it on the Shooter's Mindset Facebook page, so hopefully you see it there. But you just want all those goodies right there. He shoots with me. Oh, he does? Yeah. So, all He's right. friend so of ours. Gonna, well, that's going to be easy. Yeah, Mike Bell, you're the winner. You just got all that, that great stuff there. $250 to a dissident arms. That's a big savings on, on on a hookup there. All right, so we got the links going in the comment section here. I'll have the I'll have that link going in the comment section right about now for those of you guys looking for that. All right, so Jennifer, you had a question come in on the Facebook page. You want to hit it? Yeah, Rusty Denny wants to know if there's any lightened left-hand bolt carrier groups in the works. <laughs> you know, we we have people asking us that now and then. And we just have not gone there yet. Uh, hopefully someday we will, but it's uh, it's like we've got so many new products in the engineering queue, and yeah, we just haven't gotten to that back burner yet. On, on another thing, uh, earlier I was talking about the schools. I just it just hit me that it was the Chapman Academy at that time with Ray Chapman. That was a school in Missouri, and uh, uh, for a while there, that was where the Bianchi Cup was held every year. There you go. I'm getting seen now. I can't file all this information. <laughs> there you go. There's a lot to talk about here. Vicky. It's already 30 minutes in, and there's been a wealth of information that's just been talked about already within 34 minutes of the show. And we still got a little bit to go here. Uh, Q&A stuff um, is slowly coming in here. we got a couple that we'll hit in a second. Steve, I know you had one of your own personal questions you want to hit. What do you got? Yeah, I was looking through the JP website earlier today. I hadn't been there in a while, honestly. Um, most of you know I don't shoot a lot of rifle anyway, but I definitely have interest in it, and it's cool to learn about that, so on and so forth. Now, I know that the 6.8 round, SPC round, had gotten quite a bit of hype a few years ago, but I noticed that you guys don't really carry a rifle from what I could find that shoots that round. I mean, would you consider that, John, kind of a dead caliber? 
You know, for a while we were looking at that round, and of course the 6.5 Grendel, and we op opted for the Grendel. And uh, there were two reasons, really. Uh, the uh, the 6.8 at the time, uh, you know, I had bought some test barrels and magazines. I, I couldn't get any of that stuff to work reliably for me. Whereas the uh, the Grendel, that just uh, with the magazines that were available for that, not only did it work, but we were able to get uh, really you know incredible accuracy out of the cartridge. And of course, when you look at the selection of 6.5 bullets relative to the 6.8, uh, the, the BCs on some of the bullets are you know far superior. So that's what we were really looking for was like maximizing the ballistic potential out of the small frame platform. And that's what the, the Grendel gave us. And that, so we walked away at that point from the 6.8. And I, I don't know, I, I, had, I heard some other relatively negative feed, feedback about the cartridge. Although I think that uh, it has gained certainly some popularity out there. Interesting. One more thing I noticed on the website, which I thought was kind of cool, because um, they've developed a really great uh, reputation as of late. And I mean, I guess, you know, it's just another competitor for the big dogs in the pistol division is you guys are carrying uh, the Infinity brand firearms. So is that the JP go to choice <laughs> for handguns? Well, one year at a, uh, at a, uh, a match, or a, a pistol match. I, I, uh, I used to shoot a lot of USPSA matches around the country too. And now, now of course, with little time I've, I've got, I've got to go to rifle events. But I ran into uh, Sandy Strayer, and he, he had a display at a match. And we were looking at these pistols, and I thought, oh man, these these are the most awesome 1911-type pistols I'd ever seen. So uh, you know, we, this Dave Camick, this fellow, he came to the matches with me, my my uh, oldest employee. And we both decided we had to buy personal steroid pistols. And after we shot these things a while, I thought, well, I, we got to carry these pistols. <laughs> so, so we got set up with Sandy, and, and we've been carrying these pistols ever since. And I, I kind of look at him as the, the silk purse of, of that type of pistol. And Sandy, uh, I, mean, I kind of look at the, his pistols as being this, the same to the 1911 as what we are to the AR. He, he's got a, a real genius for... Uh, uh, pushing the envelope on the design features. I mean, his interchangeable breech face and some of these other things that he's come up with are uh, really outstanding. And, and if you ever had a chance to shoot one or play with one, you'd you know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, we, we're still selling them, and we actually we can't get enough of them. I mean, anytime we get three, four of them, man, they're gone like in a week. There you go. We have another one here. Says JP has released a lot of new products this year. One is including the manual slide action rifle. What states would this benefit? Well, as you mentioned before, all those states that are, have curtailed your personal freedom and uh, and your Second Amendment rights, uh, you know, I, we, we kind of felt sorry for them. But uh, actually, we had been thinking about a slide action rifle for for quite some time, and uh, quite honestly, DPMS had one. Uh, way back, uh, you know, during the the the, the first ban, the, uh, uh, what year? What years was that? 94, 84 to ninety four. I forget. But they they had a slide action type rifle they were selling. I don't think it was never it never seemed to be all that successful to them for them. But what really got me thinking about it, uh, uh, I was at one of the uh, <clears throat> one one of the USPSA three on nationals. <clears throat> they decided to introduce a manual rifle class. And uh, it was so funny because uh, both myself and Jake Kempton, Jake Kempton was a gunsmith for uh, Accuracy Speaks at the time, and we were both, you know, avid three-gun shooters. And everybody else showed up, and they had all their bolt guns and 6.5, 284, and all these calibers. And, and the two of us showed up with ARs that were set up to run manually, that we had to cycle manually, and we saw each other, and we just literally laughed because <laughs> we were both thinking the same thing. And so, of course, and we were just cycling the charging handles on these rifles. And uh, the first stage, of course, which we only shot out to 300 yards, the two of us finished first and second. We just cleaned everybody's clocks because these rifles were so fast. Now, the second day, they shot out the six, and we got our butts kicked in a win. But be that as it may, it made, it made me realize that there was a, uh, an application for uh, a straight pull or a slide action or some kind of a manual rifle, you know, that, that brought more horsepower, more accuracy, but yet, you know, you know, still in a manual version. And, uh, and of course, having those re that retail store all those years, working on all these Remingtons, uh, 742 and 760 series pumps, 
Uh, one of the things that always struck me about those those Remington series rifles was uh, how much more reliable, of course, the pumps were than the than the, the uh, semi-auto series. They weren't plagued by any of the issues that the that the Remington semi-auto 740, 742, 7400, that whole series uh, was. In fact, people actually brought those semi-automatic versions in that would no longer work because of rust pitted chambers, had them converted to pumps, and of course they would get more life out of them. But that's always what was churning in the back of my mind, and now that the states have banned uh, semi-automatic rifles, I felt that, hey, you know, uh, a, a pump, a slight action type, type rifle is almost as fast as a semi-auto if you, you know, account for set recovery versus, you know, versus your ability to, to uh, cycle the action. So we, we started out with the 308, our large frame print platform, the 308, the LRP07. And I was actually kind of impressed at how smoothly and how well the thing ran. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and, and really what surprised me is the reaction we got it shot. So we're, we're just about ready to go into production on that rifle now. And uh, not only for those states, but we also found that uh, there was another application. An African hunter came into our booth. And uh, he looked at this thing and he said, you know, uh, it's, it's illegal to use any semi-automatic rifles for hunting in, in Africa, but he says these would be legal. And that uh, so it kind of opened up another possible niche for these types of rifles. Yeah, there you go. And if you knew, like guys like Pat <clears throat> Kelly you know, these and, and, and the Bryans from Samson, they can run a pump-action shotgun faster than most people can run a semi-auto shotgun. There you they, go. You know, there you go. And, and this rifle, I have happened to see it at the booth at SHOT Show this year. I mean, it looks just like the rifle, like behind him, you know, behind, you know, on the wall right there. It looks just like that, but there's just a pumping action that you have to do, obviously, to bring the next round into the chamber. It just doesn't happen automatically. So very awesome. I thought the design was, you know, very innovative in itself. We have Gun Wild One here. Some of the 6.8 fans, I guess, are, are jumping in here saying, you know, hey, I love the 6.8. So uh, SPC round. So uh, Gun and Wild is one of those guys. I know our buddy John is also a fan of 6.8 uh, caliber. Uh, quick story on that. First rifle I ever bought was chambered in 6.8 SPC. That was back in a time where uh, ammo was a, a severe problem to get with 223, uh, even 9mm. I mean, you couldn't even get it at Walmart. It just what it wasn't there. So first rifle I ever owned was a 6.8. The only thing I can ever find for it was like a $30 box of Hornady, a, a box of 20 for like 30 bucks. <laughs> you can imagine how how much how quick I got turned off on that. And you know I shot like one mag and I sold it. I had to borrow somebody's ammo that he had stockpiled that was like some Remington ammo at the time. And I was like, man, I can't afford to shoot this thing. You know, so I sold it and got a regular 223.556, and that's never looked back into really any other caliber other than 308 since. Um, let's, let's see here. Into Deep One wants to see the rifle directly behind you with the scope on it. He's saying that's a very good looking rifle. I don't know if it's, you're able to pick that one up. Actually, uh, this is uh, one of our engraved rifles. We're always looking at adding some more bling. <laughs> you know, I, I say that because at one time I had a business custom painting motorcycles, so I I always have that that kind of outlook on this stuff, and I I, I hooked up with uh, Brian Powley, who is uh, in the American Pistol Smith Guild, and he is a uh, a world class engraver. Not only does firearms, but does musical instruments. So I approached Brian about uh, doing a fully engraved CTR02. He was really excited about the project, so that's another thing we introduced at shot, and uh, uh, and we're we're actually we're actually having these pre done. And we're stocking them so that again, it wouldn't be somebody could actually get one of these engraved rifles and not be waiting a year for it. Yeah, they are actually. If you go to the JP website, there is a section in the bottom right-hand corner where you can see that these rifles already engraved are available for purchase. So they, I don't know, is this a limited run? Are you guys just doing a, a couple of these and then that's it, or? Yeah, you can see it better there. There you go. That's a sweet. That's a that's a finely tuned machine, there, fellas. Yeah, this has all, all the bling plus the Duracoat custom finish on everything. There you go. Very nice stuff, man. I mean, th I mean, like I said, I told, I was telling uh, John this, uh, this story in the pre-chat. I mean, back when I had like a three hundred dollars, I think the first pistol I ever bought was actually a High Point. I was that cheap. I just, I just, you know, the gun guy, the, you know, I said hey, my budget was two hundred dollars, 
And he said, well, here's a high point. And I grabbed the high point. And then I started wanting to hook it up. I wanted to put all this fancy gear, make it look like this awesome pistol. And I realized, well, there really wasn't any accessories <laughs> for, <it. laughs> for the high point anyway. So then I bought a $300 Smith & Wesson, and I happened to come across JP website looking for accessories to buy for my pistol. And I was like, I was blown away by how great everything looked. You know, there was a hefty price tag. Obviously, I only had like a, th you know, I can only afford a three hundred dollar pistol at the time. But I'm like, this has to be the most awesome stuff. Anybody who's the who's who had to have this JP stuff on their guns. And I mean, t to this day, even though I, I knew nothing back then, and I kind of still don't know nothing, but a little bit, a little bit more than I knew back then. JP is still the go-to. You know, the, the, the it just looks great and it functions reliable. I mean, just blown away by the stuff that they offer on the website. Well, I hear you. I think we all started there. You know, I, I at one point, uh, I mean, I couldn't afford uh, anything but the lowest end stuff too. And, uh, it's, <laughs> in fact, it's kind of funny because even uh, even as up a few years ago, I was still cheap when it came to putting the glass on my rifles. Until finally, I started. I finally uh, started carrying three thousand dollars scopes like U.S. Optics. And once I started actually using them, I realized. Uh, what you were actually paying for, just like not now. I think that most of my rifles have scopes that are worth more than the rifles on them. Yeah, there, there, there you go, and that's the, the direction that I'm going now. It's like, uh, you know, I just sold an optic for an optic that was twice the cost. <laughs> so I'm like, really, that optic, really, I can build another rifle that's decent quality and still have some money left over, you know. But we're gonna go with the just drop the change on the optic this time. Uh, what do we have here? Um, let's see. Um, up up until this year, JP hasn't sold their billet upper and lower receiver sets individually. What took JP so long to sell them individually, and now they are available, correct? Well, probably because I'm a close-minded son of a bitch. But <laughs> <laughs> not really. You know, we over the years, uh, my take on it was was this: uh, uh, on these billet receiver rifles, I kind of wanted to keep the pedigree on them so people saw one and they would know that it was it was built here and uh, being that we, we have very limited production capability we really couldn't entertain selling the receivers anyway now on this step we have you know drastically increased our production capability and then of course uh, you know I finally uh, kind of uh, realized that to be competitive we we had to start thinking about Selling that more, well, we've our, 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 like I said, our basis of success is really selling the components to the home builder. Why not finally sell them the receivers in case they don't? They want to use it some other. The barrel was usually the stumbling block. You the guy that wanted to had some pet barrel he wanted to use, and uh, didn't want to build a rifle with with the barrel in it or the barrel options that we had. So we came up with another way to make sure that we can maintain some record and, and know exactly if a rifle was built in house here. Or if it was shipped, you know, as a as a chassis system or a receiver set. And yeah. it's been it's been well received. So that's one thing that we're looking at. You know, matched upper lower sets, but also uh, fact, here's one here is like a chassis system that is uh, not only an upper and a lower, but uh, a handguard. The handguard system you, your choice on there. So, and then of course you can get also with fire control parts installed, ready to go. There you go. Jen, you had a question you wanted to come. This one's from, from Zach, right? Yeah, I actually, yeah, I picked up on that one real quick. Zach Swartz was asking about plans to do a 6.5 Creedmoor and LRP, but it looks like you guys have an LP, LRP-07 that is 6.5. Is that correct? That's right. We actually want to offer the uh, 6.5s for uh, since 2012. That's when we, when we introduced the 6.5 Creedmoor. And we are just just have now introduced the six millimeter Creedmoor because this. That, and then let me go back to what we were talking about: the evolution of three gun. Uh, the the three gun sport really has evolved now into uh, precision right long range precision rifle, practical rifle. So it's it's kind of another interesting evolution. In fact, these these long range events I think are where three gun was about seven eight years ago, really on the cusp of exploding. So, and, and even in the short time, these last four or five years that this, this sport has been evolving, uh, the caliber selection and whatnot has, has changed. And so uh, the, these 243, 6 millimeter uh, Creedmoor, 
uh, 6.47. These cartridges have gained a lot of popularity because you can throw very high high BC bullets at about right about 3,000 feet per second, and, and that's the kind of velocity people are looking for in a uh, uh, a thousand yard rifle nowadays to to play this this other game. So just the straight six Creedmoors are now available. You're saying? Yes. Great. Right. Awesome. There you go. Let's jump into uh, the lightning round here. We're almost about that time part of the show here. Quick lightning round here. Don't didn't get too fancy with it, but uh, the one that everybody loves and uh, John actually shared a, a good story on this one earlier. But the lightning round. If you can only load your ammo on a Lee or an RCBS press, which one would you choose to load with? <laughs> well, uh, if I had to choose between the two, I'd probably go with an RCBS rock chucker, but. Uh, what I was telling you earlier is I actually have uh, these C&H uh, pistol champs, they're called. They're a four-station H-press. I own four of these things, and I've got them set up for uh, various rifle calibers I load. And what I like about them is they have uh, – I, I, I personally don't believe in loading precision rifle ammunition on a progressive press. It's just a, just a thing I have, but mainly because I want to be able to feel every operation. So this the the C and H uh, pistol champ is they're they're really designed as a, as a pistol press, but I use them for rifle. They got enough leverage to size a rifle case, and you move the case around. You got your three size decap, then you reprime, and your powder drop, and then you can see the bullets. So I use three of those four stations. The reason being is that it allows me to feel the neck tension of the bullet when I'm seating it, and the primer tension when I'm seating the primer into the pocket. Is that on a, on a uh, progressive press, you usually can't feel that kind of stuff because you're performing multiple operations at once. So you kind of lose your feel of what the case is, you know, what condition the actual case is. So you know, the, the first off, you got to know whether you, whether, how much primer pocket retention you got left because you don't want your primers falling out of the gun. And in, in precision rifle, that gets to be a problem because we're pushing these cartridges to the max, and you may be stretching the primer pockets on them. And so I, I know exactly how much primer tension I want. And if, it, if the cartridge doesn't meet that, I either throw it out or I put it into a into a uh, uh, practice bin. And then, of course, feeling the, the neck tension of the bullet seating in the case, that's, that's also very important because the whole, the whole key to consistent muzzle velocity really is the neck tension on the bullet. Good stuff there. Yeah, so that was a 100% uh, manual uh, press every operation. You know there were there was no turning. No. You know they're, they're, <laughs> everything was done manual. So there you go. So I didn't even he he told me that I'm like I never heard of that press. I I, I didn't yeah, even know it existed. But there you yes. go. C N H Tool. They have a website. Yeah. It's it's uh, kind of an obscure uh, brand, but uh, they're still they're still making this stuff and actually uh, uh, their stuff's very high quality. You think it's slow, but it's really not. I can load a uh, hundred rounds. On one of these CNH four station presses in 15 minutes, so it's not like wow. ungodly slow. I mean, I can do that on a, a Lee progressive press. So I mean, you're faster, you're faster uh, manually than I was able to pump out on a progressive Lee press, which was I had tons of issues with that. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, all right, so lightening it up a little bit, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris get into a street fight. Who do you have winning? <laughs> well, I think I'd have to go with Bruce Lee. <laughs> really? All right, yeah, we're not going to get into why. Oh, man. Bruce Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see. Uh, what do we have? Uh, nine millimeter or 45, the all around caliber, carry and shoot competition with. What are you going with? Well, you know, in the multi gun world, we've pretty much gone with nine millimeter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but if my life depended on it, I'd probably go with the big hole theory. Yeah, the 45 for carry. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I carry. But uh, in competition, I, it, it's funny because I never thought I'd see the day where 9 millimeter was the predominant cartridge that I was loading. Yeah, yeah it definitely is. You know, everything's pretty much 9 millimeter for competition nowadays. So, um, Let's see, uh, billet or forged? Well, uh, you know, that's a horse apiece because the forged receivers, you probably get the most strength for the least amount of weight. But on the other hand, the build receivers are a blank canvas, and we can do whatever we want with them. See, so I, I can make an argument for either one. There you go. Yeah, because if you want to do a side charging uh, uh, receiver system that has some of these other features we built into it, uh, yeah, then you know the build receivers uh, really 
There you go. Uh, direct impingement or piston system for your rifles? Well, I'm not a fan of piston rifles. You know, uh, to me it was like the answer to a question that really didn't exist. It kind of like, which end of the rifle do you want to clean? You're going to end up cleaning something. And yeah. uh, once you have really good quality parts in a direct impingement rifle, they do in fact work extremely reliably. And the other thing is they're, they're typically more accurate. Uh, if you take, uh, you know, if you take the same, same components and build it into both platforms, you can probably, like our rifles typically are in the uh, uh, sub half minute range in the 223 rifles. <clears throat> and a typical piston gun is in the, you know, typically in the minute and a half to 3 MOA. And, and it's certainly acceptable battle accuracy because 3 MOA is actually mil spec battle accuracy requirement. But is it is it good enough for a, a competition rifle? Well, no, you know, so our, our customers really aren't looking for that. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, and the last one here I have for today is zombies are outside your front office. There, rifle, pistol, or shotgun? What are you grabbing to get the job done? I guess I'd be grabbing the uh, the uh, shotgun myself. Really. <laughs> So the, the, the Remington, the Remington, yeah, my, my Remington 870 with yeah. double lock, yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't don't from the guy that sells no. the rifle. Yeah, see, no, if they're, if they're in the next block, I'm going for the rifle. Yeah. Yeah, so he's a big fan of the Remington 870. We were talking a little bit during a pre chat, and he still, he still thinks the Remington is one of the top uh, pump action shotguns there is on the market today, right? Yeah, I'm, I, I actually have one of the one of the Benelli Novas, and, and I, I I'll take my 870 any day. There you go. Very but nice. but the semi-auto, I'm going with the M2. I, I've got three of those, so. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, that seems to be the staple. Um, and there you go, Jen. You have any questions you want to hit, Steve? Got anything? Uh, there was one more on here. Hang on, let me get it back up. Uh, James Leffler. Said he just received his JP15 to shoot in three gun in Minnesota. He says he's ha got limited experience using a scope. Are there any drills I can run to speed up my match performance? Well, you know that uh, I would have to have probably a little bit more information as to like what kind of scope we're talking about here. But yeah, uh, if. Uh, Typically, I set up my rifles if they're optics rifles. I'll not only have this, the, the optic, but I'll, I'll set some, some uh, iron up at, at a 45 degree offset. And uh, it, may, it may be, of course, the fire, especially on the national level, <clears throat> you end up with not only after engaging at a distance and possibly using a ballistic information or reticle and you want to be shooting at some magnification, but then I'll have some targets that are right in front of your face. And I personally don't want to take the time to be switching my my uh, magnification back and forth and most of the close range stuff I find that you can just crank right in into your 45 degree offset iron and solve that problem and leave your scope set up for the, for the longer range. But in saying that, there's a, there's a segment I did for, uh, for, Jim, for Jim Scouting on Shooting USA that deals with uh, setting, up, uh, setting up your glass uh, on a rifle and it's a real good video segment to watch because it deals with uh, a lot of the things about scopes that people don't know and how to set them up correctly in the first place so that they get the maximum uh, maximum out of them. And that that video is on our website as well as uh, Shooting USA. There you go. Um, the website, again, for those who are unfamiliar, is uh, www.jprifles.com. We'll take you to the website there. Um, let's see. Uh, we, had, uh, we wanted to ask a question here, and I think Jen has a brief story on this. With the folks that built her rifle, but the silent, uh, the silent captured buffer springs uh, for the for the rifle. And uh, Jen, I'll let you just kind of take over on what, what what your Smith has said about that. Well, when we were looking at building my three gun rifle that Savannah River Armory built for me, uh, I had certain things that I wanted. I wanted a JP low mass bolt carrier grip, all that. I wanted the low mass everything, and he said. Uh, well, we need to get you a silent capture buffer spring. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> he was like, it's the best thing in all of, like, AR inventions yet. That is the best innovation that has been made in, in the development of ARs. And I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, so we put it in my rifle, and I love it. But, like, my armor loves those silent capture springs. That's great. Actually, that idea goes way back. 
One of my pet peeves is always the sound of these rifles, not only when you were just cycling them, you know, dry, but in, in shooting them. And uh, we just really went through a lot of pains to try to get rid of that, that twang and the scrapey, the raspy sound of, this, of yeah. the spring inside the buffer. I just hate that. And so we started individually taking the action springs and grinding a flat on them and then polishing them to a mere finish, you know, actually finishing each spring by hand like that. And then, of course, we had to hand select the buffer tubes because some buffer tubes had deformities in them that kind of made them noisier. We found that uh, certain types of tubes work better than others. So for, for years, we, we did that. And finally, our volume got to the point where we just couldn't handle it anymore, so we, we actually figured out a protocol to have the springs made, custom made for us, exactly like that, with a flat ground and polished. But that still wasn't good enough for me. I just wanted to take it that one step forward. I, I always knew that we needed to isolate the spring from the buffer tube completely. So really about five years ago, we started working on this concept. And it kind of reached an impasse. And uh, and then I hired a uh, I hired a new engineer about, uh, about that time, and so I, I brought it up to him, and I said, look, this is how far we've taken this thing, and this is my concept, and this is where we need to go with it. And within 30 days, he solved our problems with this, and we knocked this thing out, and it really was a home run for us. And so not only were we able to get the spring on a guide rod, like in, like in a 1911, and isolating it from the tube, making it completely silent, but also we were able to uh, incorporate the uh, dead blow buffer effect on, on the head using a, a series of weights. So now we have both uh, stainless weights and tungsten weights, depending on what mass you want to run and uh, whether you really get to run it in a you know, slug fire weapon and you need more dead blow effect. So yeah, it's, it's uh, I have to say that the, the product has really taken off for us. And, 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 we, and we keep, uh, we keep uh, adding more selection and more options. We got spring kit, you want to you play with the spring rates on it, you can now. Mm -hmm. So it just, it just keeps growing from there. Yeah, I think everybody needs one of those. You know, <laughs> just it's it's just it's the way it is. It's true. Even if you pick up a rifle off any gun shelf and you just you know, you know bring the charging handle back, you hear that that spring just like it's going going down the back of the stock, and you're like, well, these guys came up with a solution. If you don't like that, not only that, it works great. Forget the sound thing. What it really what I think really is the key here is that in conjunction with your low mass parts. Yeah. You know you're gonna get you're gonna get a superior product using that. Uh, we have one here from Randy Williams, and this one kind of takes the question right off my list that I had here, which was talking about the Armageddon Revolution trigger. Um, and it says, is there any benefit to running this trigger for shooting three gun? Well, the, uh, I, uh, Tom Fuller from Armageddon's been a kind of a good friend of mine in the shooting industry, and comes from the military community. And uh, he approached us. Uh, he wanted to actually do roller triggers on 1911s. And I said, well, Tom, we, you know, we really don't do 1911 parts per se. I can fix you up with someone to do that. But why don't we do an AR trigger using this concept? So we, we did. We prototyped it. And uh, I wasn't too sure about it. But the, the crazy thing is the first time I started using it, my groups tightened up. And I, a lot of what I do is accuracy testing. I, I spend a lot of time at a range doing, doing product testing, shooting groups, testing various configurations with various ammunition and whatnot. I, I need, I also I do a lot of hand loading. I need to be able to tell our customers what, what, to, uh, what to load. And uh, as soon as I started using this roller trigger, I noticed my flyers kind of disappeared. And uh, so I kind of looked at it as an idiot-proof trigger. It, it took the idiocy of my poor trigger, you know, finger placement sometimes and always rolled me right to the center. So now that all the release force was on bore axis, Instead of, so I put any, any side vector on the rifle. Now, I look at it more as something that uh, plays into the precision shooting. And I, would, I definitely got it on all my precision rifles. Uh, but, you know, once you get used to it, you realize that it also improves your ability to shoot quickly more accurately, too. So, yeah, I'd say I think it does have an application. Uh, and I'm coming, that's coming from someone who, who has traditionally never liked anything other than a curved trigger on one of these rifles. And now here's a straight trigger with a roller, and I'm, yeah, I'm completely sold on the idea myself. There you go. We're, I'm going to show you here. I'm going to try to pull up. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I have it. There's a trigger. You guys are seeing it directly off the, uh, the AP, uh, the JP website. And he has it on 
both of the rifle in the background that he showed earlier, and he'll probably pull it up again here, but that's it. I mean, it looks totally from something you, you, you haven't seen before. So a very interesting concept, so that's what we're talking about here. And take a look on how, uh, if you could pull one of those rifles one more time, show us that this trigger, because it, it, it definitely looks something different like you've never really seen before, just a, a straight bar trigger. You got one on that rifle right behind you, John? No. Oh. Yeah, there is, actually. Yeah, on that engraved rifle, I seen it when we were talking about something separate on this rifle earlier. But there it is. Yeah, so it rolls very smoothly. And, and of course, uh, the kind of trigger control that, that we that we promote is having on a gas gun is to ride the trigger not on the, tap, on the tip of your finger, but in the knuckle. And so when you use that technique and you choke up on the grip like this, and when you break the trigger, and you hold it there until recoil impulse subsides, and then you consciously hear the reset click. And by placing it there, like I said, if you're a little bit off, it just rolls right to center, and it really what it does is forcing you to put all that trigger release pressure directly in line with the bore axis on the rifle. It's kind of funny because I've seen when we do live fire demos now, I'll watch people play with it. You know, they'll dry fire the rifle, and all of us, after about four, five, six times, all of a sudden they'll get the, the smile on their face, and they, they, they can see that they just get it. Yeah, there, there, yeah. Nice. I didn't get a chance to to check that one out at the booth, man. I, I should have should have swung by there a little bit more, spent a little bit of time there. But uh, any questions, Steve? You had a couple. You had a couple lined up on your end. Yeah. Um, being the nine millimeter fanboy that I am, and knowing that we haven't really touched on this topic very often at all with, in the past with other rifle manufacturers we've had on the show. I noticed you guys have the GMR-13, and that's looking like a pretty cool little 9 millimeter option, as well as taking the Glock magazine, which is very convenient for many users. Tell us a little bit about that platform. Well, we started doing uh, 9 millimeter uh, carvings uh, using uh, some Rock River components back I don't know, maybe about five, six years ago, just because, uh, I mean, I thought they were kind of fun to shoot. And what really amazed me about them was how incredibly accurate they were. I, uh, you know, with good ammunition, I had no trouble shooting one-inch groups at 50 yards. I mean, it was really kind of amazing. So uh, uh, the next thing was, of course, I wanted to be able to use the magazine for my sidearm. And uh, the Glock was the obvious, the obvious choice. Very mm -hmm. cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. Last question, and this is coming from me as well. Um, which of those rifles that JP manufactures would you say is your favorite currently? I would have to say probably the uh, LRP07 series. As I've kind of evolved out of the three gun, and now I'm doing more precision long range shooting, and I'm, trying, I'm really promoting the use of gas guns in the precision community. And uh, I, I like to shoot these team matches, and, and one of my partners is uh, Clark Kennedy. He's kind of a fixture on the uh, on the long range precision circuit. And in 2012, we shot the uh, uh, the PST match together, and and we won. And we were the first. It was the first time a gas gun team had ever won one of these long range uh, tactical matches, because up to that point, it had been completely dominated by bolt guns. And so it was kind of funny because that on Monday morning, people were calling up to order. Gas guns and six five free board. <laughs> awesome. There you go. Let's see. Uh, what do we have here? Right, I'm I'm kind of cool on the, the Q and A right here. But um, what do we have? We also you guys offer some limited edition builds all the time, and it seems like there's one on their website right now called the Billet Beauty, which is a limited edition build that only 25 are made. Are they still available? Yeah, I think there is a few a few of uh, those left available. Uh, we. You know, we, we like doing this special edition stuff, uh, and we're going to do more of that in the future. But uh, that was that was my son Jesse. He's uh, he's in charge of some of the media stuff, and he came up with this uh, this kind of a tribute rifle to uh, World War II aircraft, and that's kind of the whole motif of the thing. You can see it online. Uh, it's uh, got the uh, uh, the Vargas girl on one side, and, and uh, a lot of polished screws like that emulate the rivets, like a P51. So. It, there's all that stuff going for it. It's kind of funny at SHOT Show. I thought that younger people wouldn't get it. They wouldn't you know, be able to connect with that piece of history. But it was surprising uh, how many people were, uh, were fascinated with it really did get where it was coming from. 
There you go. Yeah, I got a chance to see that. That was a pretty awesome build. And like you said, they only did 25 of them. So if you guys have some some cash, you were thinking about getting some nice rifle <laughs> saved up, you might want to jump on that uh, limited gun there. I have one here that just came in from Mace Ward. I uh, just wanted to say I consider the silent buffer a must-have. It is so nice to be able to easily tune both ends of the rifle after I have machined the carrier. It just makes sense. It's a fine specimen, and I include... I include all of these uh, as top of the line in my top of the line guns. So he's a big fan of the silent buffer as well. Thanks, mate, for the compliment and question. Um, also, let's get into this. And we talked a lot about this in the previous shows because it seems to be like hyped up again. It, it kind of went away and then came back. But uh, so, yeah, a lot of companies are introducing uh, the side charging AR-15 rifles. Um, JP has been doing this for years. You find the side charging AR more beneficial over what seems to be the standard AR-15 charging handle design. Well, that evolved out of us uh, doing uh, before we had our own 308 platform, large large frame platform in 308762. We were converting uh, Armalites, uh, DPMS rifles, and also the Rock River, uh, uh, the Rock River uh, rifle. They were actually they were doing it for Bushmaster at the time. And, the thing I didn't like about those rifles was the top charging system. You had, you had such a long stroke in the rifle, and the charging handle came so far out of the receiver, and it, it was really the Achilles heel. It was very easy to put a bend in that charging handle if you're trying to clear a malfunction or something. And, and once that charging handle uh, had any kind of a kink in it, that, that rifle was out of service. And not to mention that uh, uh, you had to get off the rifle completely to, to charge it or clear it. And I thought, really, you know, uh, they're, uh, you know, not that side charging is anything new, but it was new to these rifles. And so we we, we did a, a we did a prototype that had a uh, a non-folding side charging system. And of course, after slinging up into that and walking around with it for a while and having to having that stick me in the chest, I thought, well, no, we, we need to have a folding charge again. <laughs> so <laughs> and then not only do I, I want it to be folding, but I wanted a dust cover on it so that if you had a catastrophic case failure or something like that. Uh, that that would be contained inside the receiver. So that that's kind of how it evolved. And in fact, we're like on a, we're like on our eighth our eighth revision of that side charging handle system. It really have refined it over the years, make it more robust. And now, I mean, you can charge or clear the rifle without even relinquishing your, your cheek weld. Let's say you wanted to use subsonic non-cycling ammunition in the suppressed rifle. Guess what? You've also you've got a very fast straight pull manual rifle now off of it. And uh, in the LRP07, the other nice thing about it is if you are running suppressed, the receiver now without the top charge handle is really well sealed up, so you don't have any gas in your face whatsoever. So ergonomically and in many other ways, I, I just felt that it made a lot of sense. And then, of course, I, uh, we had people asking it on, for it on our small frame rifles, which I wasn't even going to go there. But after I got used to it on the large frame rifle, I realized I wanted it on everything. So then we came up with the SCR-11, which was kind of like a mirror image copy of the LRP. And then, of course, other people wanted to use that system on existing lowers. And because they did not cover up the keyhole, we were going to put a plug in there. But rather than do that, I said, well, why, not, why don't we just leave the top charge handle? So the thing has got a dual charging system. And that actually... Uh, that actually took off because the, the tactical crowd liked the redundancy. If, if, uh, if they broke one, they had another. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we got a we have a question here from Mike Bell coming up here, and I got his I got all your PMs regarding claiming your prize already. So that that already saves that already saves me saves me the hassle of making the post. So Mike Bell is here. Question for Mike Bell: What do we have? Uh, he said, when we were talking about the silent capture recoil system, he said, how does that work with the blackout and suppressors? And does that option of different springs make this the best recoil buffer system for suppressed rifles? Yeah, we actually had a lot of use in, uh, in uh, the 300 blackout, uh, running it in mine, my samples. And, and uh, uh, with a pistol port position, I found that they'll run with suppress or subsonic and supersonic ammo interchangeably, the combination of of uh, that part plus an adjustable gas system really makes the, the whole thing work. And I would suggest running the, the, the lightest spring we make out of the out of the, the they're shipped with one of the intermediate springs, but you can buy one of these spring kits that has four four possible springs. And I would recommend running the lightest one for, for that application. Slows it down just a bit. 
Yeah, you have it. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good on questions on my end, but what I wanted to hit here is that we're talking a lot about rifle accessory rifles and the innovation there, but JP also offers a uh, Glock magazine wells uh, that I that I had on my my Glock 17, and I did a video on that. It was a, an exceptional magwell because at the time there was a, I was always playing around with these. Uh, like I said, I was kind of I kind of learned the hard way. I, I I buy the cheap stuff, and then I realize, mm -hmm. oh, it doesn't work. So let me go, let me go spend a dime. Yeah. And I got a JP, I got a JP Glock Magwell. And you guys offer also offer some optics. So what what is that about? What else do you offer other than uh, only AR parts per se? You know, we we've, we've done some pistols, pistol parts. I, I gotta say, in fact, we did we used to even do a lot of revolver work at one time. Uh, but as time has gone on, uh, we've We've kind of contracted and focused on our core strength, but we're still offering uh, certain Glock components. As you know, I love Glocks, and uh, of course we have the, the J point, which is this little one of the, one of the original uh, micro dot sights, and it happens to be exactly the same width as a Glock slide. You can actually machine the slide out and fit this thing in there, and really makes an incredibly fast pistol with a dot sight milled right into the slide, melted in. So we, we, we were kind of on the forefront of doing that. Now there's a number of manufacturers that have, have adopted that. Yeah. Man, you guys have, I mean, it's easy. You guys have, like, already, you, they already thought of it, all right? It's already happening over at JP. You know, you guys can be the second to bring it out, but it seems like they already beat you to the punch as far as ideas go, man, because they had a lot of innovation going there, and they were fast to bring it out. Let me tell you how much difference that makes. Uh, when I... When I was shooting a lot of uh, USPSA pistol, and I uh, I was in uh, I was shooting an A class in mass in in, uh, in open, and I was shooting the typical Seymour on top of my gun, and uh, when I went to the melted in J point on the slide on my open gun, I jumped from uh, A class to master in one month, and it's not too often you can point your finger at one thing, one change you made that, and because that jumping from A to master was you know that that's a difficult. A difficult uh, transition to make. That's, you know, on the, on the curve of diminishing returns. I'll never make GM, but you know, when I made Master, I felt pretty good about it. It was all because now I had the sight where it needed to be, right on the slide, right on the slide where my eyes were, and I was never looking for the sight when I did a weekend transition or anything. Just yeah. point the slide. If you could point the slide, the sight was there. There you go. Yeah, it seems to be that that category where a lot of people get stuck in myself, which is like an expert class. When you get to Master. You, you really elevated your game, in my opinion. I think that's what he was referring to as far as going from A to an M class in USPSA shooting. So there you have that. Um, quickly here, I wanted to hit on this because this is kind of... You hear it pop up from time to time, and it's a little bit debated back and forth, and a lot of people have some strong opinions about it. But are you able to assemble, home assemble, a quality and reliable rifle from a mixture of parts... Um, or do you recommend just buying your factory assembled rifle or just buying all a certain brand and assembling it? How do you feel about that? There's no doubt that you can put together a really fine rifle at home. Uh, the problem that arises is that when you, if you're going to build a so-called Franken rifle, you end up buying parts from a lot of different manufacturers, and sometimes those parts will not be compatible. And, and that's, that's one of the things we look at with our stuff. We want to make sure that... Everything we have is cross compatible, and uh, you're not going to have any of those tolerancing issues or any of that kind of stuff going on. Uh, so th those are the problems I see people running into: is that they're buying a, uh, parts from a, a number of manufacturers, and not all of the, all of them will be compatible for any number of reasons. Now, you know, can you can you build a gun as good as what we're what we're building here? I I honestly think that we're throwing a little bit of voodoo at it here that the home builder is not going to be able to do. And uh, uh, but if you if you bought all our components, at least you know you're never going to have uh, the compatibility issues. There you go. Well said. Uh, Sterling White says, "Tell John I got to run. I have enjoyed the show, and thank you guys. So thanks, Sterling, for popping in. We've talked to Sterling before. J uh, JP, you know him pretty well. So yep. have a good night, Sterling. And we have here uh, from Mace Ward, jump charming back in here. Uh, I feel sometimes the lightest spring will not chamber rounds." Talking about the the silent captured uh, buffer spring, do you have any uh, do you have any issues with this and any tricks to solve his issue? 
Well, there again, I guess, you know, what, what caliber are we talking about? And if, if the light is spring, will not strip and go into battery, then there's other issues with that rifle or the ammunition, the ammunition compatibility to the chamber. Uh, what you have in a, in a, in a semi-automatic rifle, the, the round has to, what I call, drop fit the chamber. It can't be a press fit like you have in a manual rifle. So if it is, uh, you've got other issues there. I mean, I, I personally think the lightest spring we make should be able to chamber and go into battery with any caliber that's offered in the ER-15 platform. And uh, uh, now the ER-10 version of this thing, we have heavier springs because there is more force needed to strip the feed out of a 308 type magazine, et cetera. But in the small frame rifles, if, if it's not going to battery, there's something else going on there that really actually needs to be addressed. There you go. Uh, I think we, man, this is a really fun show. We talked about a lot of information here. I think we're almost down to the rundown point here. Steve, what do you got? You got any new uh, CZ Forum news? I know we talked about them last couple shows. What do you got? Not a whole lot going on. Just uh, definitely get out and check out the czforum.com. It's www.czforum.com. And that's about it, man. Just trying to train and shoot, getting back into reloading after being out for a while, um, putting together some, some good ammo. I, was, I took it out today and did some test firing, and I was really happy with my results. So just trying to get, get it going, man. The shooting season's in full swing. So Yeah, there you go. Jennifer, anything you got new on your side? Any experiments? Any new parts? What do you got? Uh, not too much new parts or anything, but um, we're kind of getting something going. Some of the guys in the area started a three-gun match here. They had kind of always done a here-and-there three-gun match a couple times a year, but it wasn't anything really consistent. So this year they've kind of solidified it to more consistent and started CSRE three-gun. So that's this Saturday coming up, and um, the Savannah River Armory that sponsors me actually is going to sponsor that match as well and going to come and bring coffee and donuts and <laughs> fix any weapons that need fixing and, you know, be there and show their rifles and all. So that's kind of exciting that that, that team membership kind of, you know, partnership is starting up or whatever. Yeah, it's always, it's always great to see your sponsor that supports you going out to support a match that you, you're going to shoot and also offer their services and, you know, just help the match become what it is because but usually without any sponsors usually you know you can't afford to put on a match you know in a mm -hmm. sense so it's always awesome to see the, your your own sponsors get involved there and uh, I don't know let's see what I think I think it's good to run it down here I mean we got discount corner so let me uh, let me just go ahead and announce these really quick uh, tacticallife.net if you use TSM10 get you 10% uh, off t-shirts grips and stickers from tacticallife.net so go check them out they offer I believe they offer some JP parts over there. They have a variety of uh, rifle accessories on their website, so go check it out. Um, Fort Mill Munitions, if you're looking for the, the pistol pistol caliber or any custom loads, teamfmn.com. Use code TSM5. will get you 5% off any of your ammunition purchases. Uh, Dewey Rods, J, uh, deweyrods.com. Use Cruise Rod 10. get you 10% off anything over at deweyrods.com. Standard Deviation Arms. Uh, TSM5, you get 5% off. They have some, you know, variety of accessories for pistol, rifle. They offer some bullets over there, so go check that out. And our friends over at Terran Tactical Innovations, uh, dot com. if you tell them the Shooter's Mindset sent you, um, you get 10% off your order. So, you know, they got those legendary base pads that we all need, like six of them. And then you're like, oh, they're like, you know, they're like 40 bucks a piece, somewhere in there. That's kind of, you know, it's hard on the pocket. 10% saves you uh, at least a few a few bucks on, on that. There we go. Fast, fast Lightning uh, discount corner there. And then I think we can run it down to shout-outs. Uh, Jennifer, we'll start with you. What do you have? Okay. Um, obviously, Savannah River Armory, who built me a great rifle with JP internals that I love. I do love that rifle. Um, shooters of Augusta and sharpshooters, they just had a rimfire challenge I went and shot this weekend. That's the first time I've ever done that. I took my kids and my thumbs are killing me from loading 1,200 mm -hmm. rounds of 22 magazines, but all three kids shot and they had a good time. So um, Getting the kids involved in the game. Yeah, loved doing that um, with them at sharpshooters of Augusta. 
Uh, load up ammunition. Great ammunition. I've not had any problems with it at all. No misfeeds. Nothing. Just runs. Put it in my Glock and it runs. Put it in my AR and it runs. Um, and of course, uh, Samson Manufacturing Operation X. Still working on getting my uh, scope mount uh, up and everything. You know, doing a video on reviewing that. TacticalLife.net. Uh, what else? What else? What else? <laughs> Lucas Oil. How can I forget Lucas Oil? Yeah, Gotta love can't, Lucas Oil. Can't forget the lube, you know, the lube sponsor. I know. It's yeah, great. So the next thing on the 22, now if they get into it, if they got the bug, they're going to be like, Ma, this Vicorsen, this Vicorsen Custom looks really good. And you know, there you go. Now you're spending $2,000 on a, on a <laughs> 22. Oh, <laughs> Lord. Don't tell me that, Anthony. Yeah. You don't, tell you dare here, tell, don't you dare tell my kids that. If you get on sure, Facebook sure. and tell my kids yeah, that. I'm they'll already. find it eventually. If they, they search, they'll see it. And they have the grips all fancy. It's a really good-looking pistol. Uh, if I was to ever go hardcore 22, you have to get one of those. So um, let me see. Steve, what do you have as far as shout-outs? Obviously, czforum.com. I mentioned them earlier. Weapon Shield. George over Weapon Shield has been a huge supporter. But the biggest thing I want to focus on today is... Uh, our first responders, you know, I, I know Anthony and I both have a ton of friends here in Florida that are first responders, either law enforcement or, you know, the fire department, so on and so forth. I'm sure Jennifer does as well. And with all the BS that goes on across the, the nation and even what's going on in Baltimore, and thank God that's kind of settling down now, but let's give those guys a shout out. Yeah, I agree. Big shout out to those guys, the paramedics, firefighters, you know, probably some of them are watching today. Thank you for your service. And let's go um, giveaway really quick before we end the show, and then I'll go on to a couple shout outs and then we're done. But for those of you guys that didn't catch the first one, we have two silent captured buffer JP springs uh, going out today. We have two winners winning this giveaway. We have one AR-15 style JP handguard, which is a 12.5 inch handguard. We have a JP full mass carrier. We have uh, from Blade Tech Industries, we have their Revolution Holster Kit. And from TacticalLife.net, we have their Shore Grips. You can get a variety of bonus entries by liking JP, uh, Tactical Life, all their Facebook and social media stuff. So take advantage if you haven't liked it already. Uh, we're going to have two winners uh, less than a week from now. Um, so next Wednesday on episode 87 of the Shooter's Mindset, we'll select two winners. And they will we'll select how we're going to split the giveaway items up. But... You guys get it. You can find a, in a link to this giveaway in the comment section below this video or on the Shooter's Mindset Facebook page. And you guys have plenty of time to enter, so you guys have to next Wednesday at 8, 8 p.m. Eastern time. So there you have it. Shout out to my end quickly. I want to thank John Paul and, uh, and Gunner for setting this up. We kind of talked at SHOT Show. We had talked a little bit previously to that, but then I, I saw you guys at SHOT Show, and that's kind of how it all came about. Um, so thank you guys for coming on and spending your your time and you know two hours with us here on on the oh, show. My, yeah, so my pleasure. I really enjoyed it, and uh, certainly would uh, love to do it again sometime in the future. I got awesome. one other, one other thing I want to remind people that they should uh, sign up for our, our uh, email uh, list because we got a book that comes out uh, every so often. In fact, it's coming out in, in two days from now, and that has a a lot of tech tips in it. It's got tips from our our pro shooters. A lot of really good information in it. It'd be well worth signing up for it. Yeah, sign up for the email list. Go to the website. Sign up for that. Any more shout outs you wanna you wanna hit, John? You know, I want to say thanks to uh, all of the sponsors that that uh, step up with us to support all these events. Because to me, the future of the firearms ownership and the shooting sports in this country is really getting more and more people into competitive shooting. Uh, you, can, you can say what you will about about the hunting, but that is really, a, I think, a more difficult thing and a more limited thing for people to do. And uh, this explosion of competitive shooting gets a lot more people involved in, in firearms and understanding it from the good side and really understanding how professional the people are that are involved in it. So thanks to all those sponsors that partner up with us at like the Rocky Mountain and all these other events. There you go. Well said. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely an explosion. A lot of women getting involved. Yeah. You, you see a lot of the kids, you know, younger and younger, they're already a grandmaster by the age of 12. Yeah. I'm like, dude, come on now. You know what I mean? They're already right. beating me, and I've been shooting it for, you know, a couple of years now. So, yeah, the kid, they're definitely getting younger, and a lot of more women get involved, which you like to see um, in, in competitive shooting. 
quick uh, shout out to Mayan. I want to give a shout out to Rainier Ballistics. Fine bullets over there, Rainier Ballistics. Go check them out. If you're not loading with Rainier Ballistics, you're, you're just doing it wrong. All right, there you go. Um, uh, Techwear USA. Jennifer has some awesome Techwear USA jerseys in her background there. Mine's on the way. So Techwear USA, give a shout out if you need any jersey needs. Um, snag Mag and Traction Grips. So we're going to keep it short, nice, clean, and simple here. Thanks to Traction Grips and Snag Mag for their support. And Blade Tech Industries and Fort Mill Munitions for helping us out on the show, man. It's really appreciated. Steve, Jennifer, it's awesome having you guys on helping me out with this. And John, man, awesome pleasure to have you on. We'll do it again sometime in the near future. And I think that'll conclude episode 86 of the Shooter's Mindset, guys. Thanks for joining us. We're out. See you next Wednesday. All right. See you.